And uh, again, arriving in London, I lost everything. So what can we do? We said, look, we've come with enough to buy a corner shop. So what can we do? We can buy a corner shop. We can work hard and we can make money to pay, get a square meal every day or at least breakfast, lunch and dinner, however basic it is. We can go to the local school because education is free here, unlike in Africa or anywhere else. Mm. We can uh, get medical cover because it's all covered here, but we can work and earn our way in. What we will not do is take state handouts because we've not paid into the system. Welcome to Push To Be More with me, your host, Matt Edmondson. This is a show that talks about the stuff that makes life work and to help us do just that. I'm chatting with the amazing Ram Gidamore from uh, just from every company known to man, it seems. Ram is the most connected person that I know. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about his adventures and struggles as a British Asian refugee and his new book, My Silk Road. So we're gonna get into all of that. You're not gonna wanna miss it, let me tell you. Now the show notes and the transcript from today's conversation will be available on our website, pushtobemore.com. Uh, also on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter and each week we will email uh, the links from the show uh, direct to your inbox with all the notes, everything beautifully, totally free, amazing. So make sure you sign up for the newsletter. Now this episode is brought to you by Orion Media which helps entrepreneurs and business leaders set up and run their own successful podcast. Now Ram uh, is like I said, an incredible networker. It's one of the things that's always intrigued me uh, about Ram is his ability to build networks. And one of the things that I've discovered with podcasting and doing podcasts like this and the other podcasts that I do is it's enabled me to build networks, which is why I think just about every entrepreneur and business leader should probably have their own podcast because it has a huge impact on your own business. Of course, this sounds great in theory, but in reality, there's a whole problem of setting up distribution, getting the tech right, knowing who to get on the podcast and getting the strategy right and all that kind of good stuff. Well, that's where Orion Media comes in. It takes care of all of that sort of stuff. So I get to talk to cool people like Ram uh, and they take care of everything else. And I get to do what I'm good at and they brilliantly take care of the rest. So if you're wondering if podcasting is a good marketing strategy for your business, do connect with them at Orion Media. That's A-U-R-I-O-N media.com. Uh, and of course, we will link to them in the podcast and show notes too. Now, all that aside, Ram was born into India. Uh, and, and born into an Indian immigrant family, let me get that right, in Kenya. And he has worked for over 30 years at board and senior management level in the private, public and voluntary sectors. Now at present, he is among other things, chair of Cotton Connect. He's the author of several books, including my Silk Road. We're going to get into some of the stories of that. Uh, he is a recipient of honorary doctorates uh, from three universities. I don't even have one. Uh, he is included in the High Flyers 50, the 50 most eminent people of Indian origin living and working outside of India. In 1998, he was appointed a CBE by Her Majesty the Queen. Wow. Ram. Welcome to the show. What a bio. I can't remember ever reading uh, one like that before. So it's great to have you here. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you, Matt. And great to connect with you. And uh, yeah, looking forward to a conversation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you and me both. Now you are dialing in from your home down south and you're talking to me uh, from my home here in Liverpool. But it's fair to say we've known each other a few years, uh, which has been great. And we've, we've, we've connected over some of the many companies that you've been involved with. But Ram, tell me uh, My Silk Road, right? This is your new book. Why did you decide to write uh, this book? Because you, like we said in the bio, you've written quite a few already. So why, why, why this one? Yeah, I mean, my first book, in fact, was called Sari and Chips, yeah. which I wrote <laughs> for a very clear reason, <laughs> because uh, 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 that was in 94, uh, when I saw a panorama program and that highlighted the attempted suicide rate amongst young Asian girls being four times the national average, oh, wow. it got me to look more because I have six sisters. Um, I'm aware of a lot of uh, uh, the, the sort of women in our community, and I just know the differential 
uh, uh, between the men and women, the way they're treated within the community. And so as I researched more, I realized at that time that there is an issue here that needs to be highlighted in the public square. So I wrote my first book uh, to highlight the fact uh, of, of the reasons why uh, the attempt at suicide rate amongst young Asian women was four times the national average. Mm. So I wrote a book because a colleague of mine said, publish or perish. You've got to publish, <laughs> get your ideas out in print, put them in the public square. And that's the one way to really make a difference. So I, I followed that. And it really did help, help me mm. because you know, the book has been picked up globally. Uh, the United States, the Chinese community have picked it up. They said it's not just Indians or South Asians. This cross-cultural tension and pressure is global. Mm. So fine. So having, and that's as recently, you know, 94, the book was writ written as recently as last week when I was in New York, <clears throat> this was raised again. And this time with the Korean community, I was sitting next to a Korean banker uh, in, in, near Wall Street in New York. And this guy said to me, hey, that same issue is in our community. So I sent him my book. That's, you know, <laughs> since 94. So then when it came to the latest book, um, the 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 uh, uh, lockdown was in full swing. He says, uh, I, "I was uh, uh, it was my seventieth birthday. Uh, nobody could come, and so the children, the grandchildren, uh, unknown to me, contacted. Oh, must have been a couple of hundred different people, uh, relatives, uh, all my different networks, mm. uh, connections, and they picked up people uh, who would then send in a video or send in a message or send in a picture." And they compiled this amazing one and a half hour video for me, oh, wow. which was such a treat on my 70th birthday, unknown to me. Suddenly, my laptop goes on, Zoom is on, uh, and there they all are, the family, children and grandchildren. And we go Fantastic. through this video. Mm. And I just thought, wow. And then the questions, who are these people, Papa? Who, 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 who's this uncle? And who's that auntie? And so as I heard those questions, I thought, Hmm, maybe I should write some stuff down for them. So I started writing it for the grandchildren, mm -hmm. just stories. And as I was writing and putting stuff down on print, uh, my, a, a friend who was a publisher somehow got wind of this and said, you know what, your story is worth publishing. I said, well, I'm not going to publish it. This was for my children. <laughs> if you want to publish it, you do it. If you have that much faith and confidence, I leave you to do it, my friend. Fantastic. But, I, 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 you know, that's your call. And, and, and so he was serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I was going to take four or five years. Uh, he wanted the book to be launched uh, on the 75th anniversary of Indian independence from uh, Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, it so it, it so happens it is the 50th year since we were expelled from East Africa with mm -hmm. Idi Amin expelling the Jagana nations. So, um, by the way, an event we'll be celebrating on uh, or commemorating on Wednesday at Buckingham Palace. Uh, with with King Charles the Third, no wow. less, because wow. that is all about uh, you know the fifty mm. years since the United Nations were expelled, and indeed the East African nations. So yeah, uh, uh, I literally went out of my way then in the during lockdown, year and a half, uh, accelerated the writing and got the book ready mm. just in time for its launch in Delhi on the twenty sixth of August. I arrived at the hotel. There was the box of books. And on the 26th, the book was launched in Delhi. It's wow. now being launched in London on the 25th of November. Uh, there is plans to launch it in New York. In fact, I was in New York last week. Yeah, you sent me this photo, right? <laughs> I thought it. this photo, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, perfectly sums up uh, my understanding of Ram Giddemore. Uh, he sent me a photo on WhatsApp, and it was you with the mayor of New York, right? And he was holding... He was holding this. He was holding your book. And so I'm like, Ram, how did you do that? Uh, go ahead. Tell the story. <laughs> well, I'll tell you the story. I, I was in New York for a board meeting. Uh, uh, this particular board uh, brings together uh, local government and uh, Wall Street business leaders and business leaders from across the states. But really it started in New York. So Wall Street and the churches in New York. There's mm. an amazing pastor there called Tim Keller, who's very well known. And his church, Redeemer Church, started this along with other churches. And the idea of bringing them together was to look at what are the issues facing our city from these three different perspectives. Where mm. are the gaps and where is the duplication? How can we best use the limited resources in our cities to really bring about regeneration, hope and life as we mm. want to see it? 
So this meeting was a board meeting which brought together local churches and local government. And I really wasn't expecting the mayor of New York to be there. We normally get an official from the mayor's office. I was amazed when I got to this meeting in the morning, the mayor of New York himself here. I said, wow. And this mayor of New York is, is an amazing guy, really. I mean, I just loved mm. seeing him elected. And of course, he spoke. And uh, here he was uh, speaking about the disadvantage in the communities, the needs of the communities, which is why we were all there together. So I thought, hmm, I've got a copy of my book. Uh, now, I've had, a, I've had my first book, Sari and Chips with John Major. Uh, I, I've had uh, my second book, The UK Maharajas with Tony Blair. Uh, I, I've had Edward Heath in a photograph. I mean, you know, th th and all these have happened, if I'm honest. Um, I suppose the term is I had to ambush them. <laughs> 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 but they loved it. I mean, they're all politicians, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, they love yeah. it. There's a photograph. It's going to go public. They, 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 they'll only get more votes. So yeah. this time I saw him standing there and I thought, hmm, let me have a go here. This is United States. I've never done it in the US. So I walked up that book. I saw where the video cameras were. I saw where the, where the cameras were. I saw his exit path. I sort of walked across very slowly as he approached the end of his speech, waited patiently. And as he approached me, I said, Mayor, I want to let you know that I ran for mayor of London in 2000 and again mm -hmm. in 2004. Of course, I didn't make it. You've made it. My congratulations, Mr. Mayor. And by the way, would you mind if I pose with you for a photo <laughs> with my memoirs? Of course, he instantly took it. Click, click, click. And the rest is history. You got the picture. So fantastic. <laughs> yeah yeah no it's it's fantastic it yeah, yeah absolutely if i remember i'll put a i'll put the a copy of the photo up it's um it's interesting you talk about this ram because i like i say this is just my you know, this paints a perfect picture of you in in my in my opinion um i was reading through your book and you've got this beautiful sort of forward by dame prue lee right dbe mm -hmm. uh, and in there um she talked about how what was the quote she said let me let me quote it directly from the uh, from the page it says here i've known ram a long time and i'm not surprised that the threads that run through the book are so constant and strong the importance of family hard work constant learning moral decency and prayer matter deeply to him his motto never let what can't be done stop you doing what can be done and when i read that i thought that perfectly sums up Ram, never let what can't be done stop you from what can be done. And um, I just, I mean, the book is just littered with these stories where I'm like, how did you, how did you even have the tenacity to go and do some of these things, right? So I want to get into that a little bit. And I just thought that story with the mayor was brilliant. Uh, so thank you for sending the photo. Uh, it made me chuckle. Um, so the podcast, Push to Be More. Ram, if this is... Uh, if this is the intro from, uh, I'm just going back to the page, from uh, the, from, I just thought it was brilliant, from the, the on the, uh, from Dame, oh, let me read this properly, Dame Prue Lee, yeah, sorry, I was getting the names mixed up in my head. But she talks about how never let what can't be done stop you doing what can be done. What, where did that come from? Why is that so embedded in your character? Well, you know, uh, I suppose as I was growing up, uh, so for example, um, uh, you know, I went, I, I come from a Hindu family, brought up in the Sikh faith, educated in the Muslim school. So in the Muslim <laughs> school, I'm in the Muslim school, I'm in a minority, right? And yet, I made it to head boy in that school, which was a shock to the, the Muslims in the school because it was always a Muslim, and to many others, and of course, <laughs> most of all to me, and you know. <laughs> That, that gave me a real message that, look, uh, I had assumed until the day I actually saw the notice on the notice board, somebody had to take me there. I said, okay, Ram, come and see. And I was 16 at the time. They said, come and see on the notice board. Look, you're the head boy. I said, I don't believe it. You know, that just can't be done. Mm. How did that happen? I mean, that, that is unthinkable. I mean, what will the rest think? What will the community think? who fund the school and run the school and the families who, who are waiting for their kid to become the head boy. And, you know, it taught me a lesson that, look, you thought it can't be done. Some things you have done have somehow made that possible. 
And, uh, and uh, I reflected back and I said, I suppose the teachers have seen something that even I can't see. So let me really uh, go along with that thought of it can't be done. You know, it, it, if you say it can't be done, look, what can you do? So mm. to, to give you an example, when, when it came to, uh, for example, running for mayor of London, mm. well, you can't do it. I said, look, what can I do? I can't put my name forward as a candidate. This is mm -hmm. because of the amount of all the young people who were telling me, do, 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 do this. Uh, I can uh, go forward as a businessman. I'm a businessman. And Tony Blair, the prime minister, was asking for businesses. So I, I, I made a list of all the can-dos. I can do this. I can do that. I can. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I won't become mayor. I don't know. But at least I can do those things. Let me have a go. And so it's this having a go. So, for example, when I came to England, I arrived as a refugee. Mm. Uh, the family were expelled from East Africa, 24 hours notice. We, had, we arrived in London uh, and effectively it resulted in 15 of us with four bedrooms, one bathroom and toilet combined. And we started life having had a major 15 bedroom facility in Kenya and before that in Africa palace. Mm. And I said, to answer your question, what made this possible? When I look back at my grandparents, who had set up this global trading business from the Sindh, which is now in Pakistan, but which was British India, Hyderabad Sindh, okay, in India, effectively. And they set up a global, global trading business in the 1890s and early 1900s, mm. supplying silk from Japan to uh, East, Central and South Africa. How did they do that? No internet, no telexes, <laughs> no telephones. I mean, it's incredible. Just telegrams yeah. and letters that took ages to arrive, but they did it. And they made enough money to build a palace in 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 in, in, in Hyderabad, Sindh. And uh, I mean, and our caste was the lowest of the low castes. They paid their way to improve their eligibility, their 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 uh, profile within the community, and mm. were accepted as you know, yeah, these these people are okay. They're part of the elite. And then they lost everything. Partition took place. Uh, you know, Britain divided India mm. into seven countries or whatever, and boom we had to flee on a ship and i thought back to my grandparents fleeing on a ship arriving in mombasa kenya and having to start life again but they did it so they could have said oh we can't do anymore you know we've lost everything but they did mm. it and within years by 1967 when we were expelled from east africa they had done very well mercedes cars um, drivers uh, 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 you know huge uh, uh, it was fantastic uh, in fact, the book has a picture of our flats, of course, 50 years later, so it's dilapidated. But these three flats all combined to give us 15 rooms as a family was incredible. Mm. Right mm. In the center of town, downtown. And uh, again, arriving in London, lost everything. So what can we do? We said, look, we've come with enough to buy a corner shop. So what can we do? We can buy a corner shop. We can work hard and we can make money to pay, get a square meal every day or at least breakfast, lunch, and dinner, however basic it is. We can go to the local school because education is free here, unlike in Africa or anywhere else. Mm. We can uh, get medical cover because it's all covered here, but we can work and earn our way in. What we will not do is take state handouts because we've not paid into the system. That was my father's very clear message. Yeah, I read that in the book and I thought, goodness me, that... That's quite a strong, bold statement yeah, to make. Certainly, because this is what this is in the six, uh, late sixties, early seventies, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, the world was a very yeah, different I, place back then. I tell you, uh, my, my, one of my brothers decided to go and get a handout and came home to. Um, I'll be honest with you, a beating. <laughs> this wow. is the 60s. Yeah. He, you know, wow. this is a, a Indian culture, our home. He just said, don't you ever dare do that again. You work, you pay, you earn, you do it. So that really was what we were brought up with. So again, it was always, what can you do? You can work hard. Mm. Uh, the previous owners opened the shop at seven and shut at five. What can we do? There was no law, law, no law restricting us opening at four o'clock and having newspaper rounds. We could, we can do that. So we did it, added mm. value to the business. Um, you don't have to shut at five. Um, you know, by the time you get the evening, uh, in those days, you had the evening standard and the evening news. And, uh, the, you know, the last edition would come with the city prices. So that's around six o'clock. We said, nope, stay open. Mm. And then we noticed at, at, at nine o'clock at night. Oh, oh the bingo. Crowd, you know, the bingo. Exactly. Mm. We mm. said, look, we can open the shop at night. There is mm. no law pre 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 preventing that. Mm. So we worked around all these things and said, you know, what can we do? What can we do? Let's do it. 
And within two years, my brothers, uh, cousins, in-laws, six shops, uh, like a chain uh, uh, down the street where we could help one another. So, for example, when one of the newspaper distributors said, uh, we can't supply newspapers to two to, 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 to my brother in Chiswick and to my other brother in uh, Askew Road, further down in Shepherd's Bush. We said, it's all right, we'll double our order and we'll supply them. <laughs> and again, you can do that. You're not preventing me buying twice the news of the worlds and yeah. twice the times and twice of everything. Can do it. So let's do that. So same asset now, greater utilization. You can do it, no law preventing that. And suddenly, you're in, and within you know within a year, within two years, we were sort of at least uh, very solvent, and uh, and uh, the the family was you know well provided for. So so, uh, I mean, but they were, you know they, one of the things I'll tell you we couldn't do, we started doing was I walked on my own to school, mm. and the first day on my way back, boy, this was a time Enoch Powell was making speeches, right. big speeches against immigrants. And that gave license to the locals to say, right, you can beat them up, you know, just hassle them, abuse them. So I'm walking back from school and I tell you, uh, it was terrifying. You know, three, four guys behind me. I mean, where our school was, was a tough area. Mm. We were placed, you know, I'd come from a very good school in Mombasa, Kenya, where I got uh, five A's for my O-levels, five, you know, great top grades yeah. for my O-levels. And then, then I was now sent to this comprehensive school behind Wormwood Scrubs. Wormwood Scrubs is a prison, prison in Western yeah. London. Yeah. And so you can imagine who <laughs> the inmates and their families nearby. And so these were very tough kids. And they would follow us, follow me and my sister said we had the same experience. These girls were following us and she just mimicked shouting. So they said, right, from now on, okay, we can't go on our own, but we can go in threes and fours. Mm. So I'm not going to say to them, I'm not going to school. We can go in threes and fours, stay close together. And then the other thing we could do, I'll tell you, we bought blue and white scarves, blue and white gloves, and blue and white hats, Queen's Park Rangers colors. <laughs> Yay, man, I'm still a supporter of QPR. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's, it's a, it was like, you know, your protection, right? Mm. And uh, then at least half the kids wouldn't get you because they said, nah, he's all right. He's a mate, supports mm. our team. Mm. And, you know, you have to learn how well, to adjust and adapt. But yeah. can do is important. What can I do? Always been a philosophy and continues to this day. <laughs> yeah, so that philosophy then, and because you read the, the book, right, and it, I read the, that philosophy in obviously your life. Um, I read it uh, in the, the stories that you tell about your family. Do you know what I mean? It's like this is not just a, something that was peculiar to you, was it? This was something that seemed to be... Uh, part of your uh, heritage, I suppose, you know, from from your family, something that you've that you've sort of bought in. So have you tried to instill this attitude with your kids and with your grandkids. Is that part of the reason for writing the book? Yeah, I mean, it's a legacy. Part of the reason really for writing the book was uh, when the publisher sort of approached to say he's going to do it, even if he hadn't published it. My plan was this is a legacy for the children, mm. uh, more than more the children, the grandchildren. They were asking the questions and therefore what future are they going to go into because uh, in a sense yes we've now been here since 1960s so it's like 50 60 years mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there's always the challenge and the tension of can what happened in british india and can what happened in east africa ever happen again so i'll be honest with you when 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 brexit happened mm -hmm. yeah I immediately called the children and said, be careful. This is really a move in the country that is going in a direction which worries me because um, it, it really is one that's, as we have in the current government, you know, yeah. uh, the Home Secretary dreaming of people being put on a plane to Rwanda. I mean, I could have that been one crazy. of those if I'd, arrived, if I'd arrived today. So I'm just yeah. saying, again, it, it was all about saying to the children, look, be careful and all, but always, always bear this motto in mind. What can you do? So we, you know, what we can do is put our heads down and walk straight and mm. keep working hard and d d d don't get into trouble. You know, so it's that kind of thing. And it's, 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 I know sounds terrible in today's day and age to have that kind of attitude, but that subtext of suspicion, you know, <laughs> Matt continues in society, but even if it's not obvious or seen, yeah. there is that subtext. And so therefore, you, you know, yeah. Do you find, Ram, if I, if I can touch on this point, obviously, I mean, the stories of you getting 
chased and beaten when you're at school because of your skin colour is, you know, is, I suppose is indicative of a time. But it is very sad when I sit here and listen to it now in the context of the, the, the world in which we currently live. Um, have you, do you, how do I word this question? Has racism um, in, improved is a wrong word, I suppose. I don't want racism to improve. It's the opposite of racism. Have we got better as a nation um, in welcoming people of different ethnic origins, for example, yeah. or, or do you think it's still I mean, a big problem? I, I, I mean, to answer your question, I suppose it must be, because when you look at the government, okay, uh, members of parliament, of a prime minister who has mm. identical background to me, twice migrant like me from uh, British India to East Africa to here, mm. very, very similar sort of background. And uh, the fact that he could make it, that the Home Secretary's current and past could make it and others. You, you look at that, mm. there's clearly been a significant breakthrough and improvement. And that's only a good sign of, mm. because it, it, it's happen it's, it is happening at the elite level, all right? Mm -hmm. Let's be clear. These are people who've been through banking in the city, Oxford, Cambridge, Eton. Uh, I mean, you know, they've, they've had that, 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 that background uh, already in this country. But it's good that they're making their way because then it makes it appear normal to have that. Yeah. Whereas previously, I know how tough it was to even imagine that. So like when I ran for mayor of London, uh, I know that in terms of the media, they just didn't want to know me. Really? BBC would Oh yeah, the BBC wouldn't allow me my broadcast, even though I was eligible for one. The 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 newspapers uh, would turn up at meetings, but never ever give me front page or photographs in the newspapers. It was always the other, you know. No, 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 no. Stick with the main people. So uh, I mean, I did get a hundred thousand votes. I broke through all the sort of mindsets I could in in the year two thousand and retained my deposit, which shocked everybody. I mean, the fact that. That, that, that getting that many votes, saving my deposit and, and beating the Green Party created such a stir was like, who is this man? Mm. You know, it's the, it's the title of the chapter in the book. Who is this man was the question yeah. being asked, you know, after the election. I know I got a call from friends saying, Rand, they're asking in the House of Lords, House of Commons, who is this man? Who knows him? Where did he suddenly come from? 100,000 first and second preference votes. That's astonishing to be able and, and to save his deposit and to technically win a seat on the London Assembly just like that. 100 mm. day campaign and boom, I was there. You know, they, they, they couldn't believe it. Who is this man? Mm. So from that to today where, you know, it, 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 it has shifted. But on the ground, I must say, that suspicion still exists. Today's news headlines of uh, 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 the, uh, one of the centers in Dover being 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 attacked with a with, with, with a firebomb or something yeah, uh, because that, of the, yeah. that's where the refugees are arriving. Uh, to see um, even when the current prime minister was elected, uh, one of the radio shows LBC, a caller calls in and he makes this comment: "Look, this is England. Uh, we are the majority English." We cannot have a prime minister who does not reflect us. You know, he was passionate about that. Wow. So the fact that you have that, yeah. and of course, uh, uh, now I'm not saying that the whole Brexit campaign was racist or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I know when I when I look at the the the, the tenor on the ground, the, the note on the ground, you can't help thinking there's something there which which doesn't where foreigners are not like. Yeah. Look, I mean, that's life because you go to India. And you got the same sort of parallel there where the where the where certain sector of the Indian population doesn't like the minorities. Yeah. You go to you go to you go to Rwanda, Burundi, and you, so every country has its issues here. So mm -hmm. it's not unique in Britain. But the fact is, we need to acknowledge and recognize it's there, which is why there is a law. We wouldn't need a law if everything was normal, would we? No. The fact that the law had to be passed to give the rights tells you there is a fundamental underlying issue here, mm. which. which Thank God there is a law because in the 60s when you arrived, there was no law, no. you know, and it was a lawless situation. So, you know, who would I turn to when I got assaulted? But now I know I would go say, oh, he's breaking the law. He's assaulting me because. And so yeah. there is that level of structure and, and yeah. protection. Yeah. But uh, ultimately, every society has it. It, it, it. To answer your question, of course, it's improved. But with every wave of new migrants who comes who, who come in, Mm. It reunites. It 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 just re revives the old uh, battles of uh, race and ethnicity and the violence that sadly can 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 follow it, but um, mm. not as prevalent as certainly when I arrived. But I speak now as one who's 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 been here for this period. 
when I talk to the newly arrived people, that every wave I've spoken to, whether they were Sudanese in the in the year 2000s or the Albanians or the 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 uh, uh, current wave, I mean the Ukrainians have been welcomed yeah. because they are European. Yeah. But they, but but not the Ethiopians and not the Sudanese and not the mm. others. So you know there is a differential already there in terms of priority given to whom. So they, yeah. these are issues that need to be worked through. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? That that, that whole thing, um, like you say, with the Ukrainians because they're European, but there's plenty of other wars going on, and you kind of think, well, we're not doing this. We're not paying British households, whatever it is, three hundred and fifty some pounds or something to house refugees from other nations from the middle um, east for example or wherever yeah yeah, yeah I, and it's right i mean you know i you have your uh thoughts on this ram and i have mine and you know my wife works with refugees and asylum seekers and yeah. she teaches them english she does it voluntarily um yeah. just things like how to get on a bus because we just show yeah. them in a hotel and we don't give you do, it's just it, the whole system yeah. still needs a bit of work, I think is it probably does. a fair yeah. thing to say. Absolutely, yes. you know, spot on, well said, because I know my sister-in-law teaches refugees and I myself, when I ran for mayor, uh, went and addressed refugee groups and simple stuff, you know, that no one tells you. Mm. You suddenly say, oh, I wish I knew. Oh, is that all you've got to do? Yeah, you know, and this is how you get on a bus. This is how you use the system. It's, um, yeah, there, there's basic stuff like that, which, as you said, just get in the hotel and wait. <laughs> yeah, it's just. So how did you, um, so here you are, right? You're you're living in the UK um, as a, an, a British Asian refugee. Um, you've grown this sort of business empire starting at the corner shop and then you know things grow and, and develop and there's the whole story with your education which is just phenomenal as well but so like you say in 2000 2004 you thought to yourself i'm gonna run for mayor <laughs> I mean, what why would you what, what i don't mean to be flippant but why 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 what made you to sort of sit there and kind of go well i'm gonna run for mayor because i can well, i'll tell you what it was actually young people one of the sort of passions i have is encouraging young people Right. So which mm. is why I started I worked with Steve Chalk on Christmas Cracker, you mm. know, when I came back to the slums of Bombay. You know, the answer to your question goes all the way back, quite a way back. But the, the turning point for me was when I, I was running this business, as you say, uh, helping run the business, I should say. Uh, it was a, it, the extended family uh, uh, who had started it. And I was the UK group chief executive. Uh, I was doing really well. I would moved to Geneva for eight years, uh, France and Geneva and now in Scotland and London. And 7,000 people worldwide, 15 countries, turning over $200 million. It was just phenomenal, you know. Wow. And this is the 80s, all right? Wow. And then I visit uh, 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 Bombay, India, on a business trip to buy seafoods for the plants in Scotland. Because in Scotland, they were saying there ain't any fish in three months a year. So all the women, which are, who are the main workers, uh, get laid off. Mm. And I said, hey, that's a bit silly. You know, there is fish in the globe. Uh, I've seen, you know, from my, with my global background that there is fish in other parts of the world. Let me go to India and get some fish. So mm. I went to India to buy fish. And I was right. Everywhere there were ports, there was tons of fish. I said, hey, we're going to import this. And for the three months, they don't get fish. We're going to make sure the workers have work. And what does that do? It means for three months, you're not paying unnecessary money out and losing an asset without using it. Mm -hmm. Your unit costs go down. You're actually going to beat the competition and even better. But here I was in India at the end of a 10 day trip. Uh, and uh, I said to my, my colleagues and some friends, look, I want to know what the businesses that we are dealing with do uh, for their communities. I just like to know it. I'm curious and uh, it helps me sometimes decide who I deal with, mm. because obviously there are those who really do good work in the community. I said, they deserve the business. And sometimes even if there's a marginal difference in price, I said, no, but they are doing good. Let's encourage them to do better and do even more. So I went to the, I was taken to the slums of Bombay, the largest slum in Asia. And uh, the Haravi, this is by the way, where Slum Dog Millionaire was shot many years later, but I was there in 87. And okay. what I saw just broke me. You know, mm. I saw firstly the five-year-old boy and I had a five-year-old son at home in Scotland, uh, in Perth. And the, here I was in, in Bombay and I saw this five-year-old. I said, oh, where does he stay? Which box is he in? They said, box, forget it. He can't afford to pay the slumlord to get a space in one of those cardboard boxes on the pavement. Slumlord, cardboard boxes, pavement. So where does he stay? They show me this pipe. 
said, goodness me, it's a huge big water pipe. And they said, he's in there, you know, it gives him some protection and he does everything there. I said, can I go and have a look? They said, you won't get anywhere near it. <laughs> the stench is foul. You just mm. can't. It's unhealthy and you can't get near it. Phew. So then I said, what about his dad? They looked at me with a wry smile. Mm, well, not the right question, Ram. We, nobody knows. But uh, mum, oh, we can tell you where she might be. And they take me just a further out, f- further around the slum, and there are th- th- there are these cages, and I mean cages, and no. there are these young girls locked in cages, and I'm thinking, God, that can't be right. And, and so it doesn't take much imagination for a man to know what's mm. going to be happening to those girls. And you know, it just broke me. I came back and I was thinking, couldn't help thinking more and more about what I'd seen. It just stunned me, shocked me. Went on my flight to, it was Air France, first class from uh, Bombay to Paris, Paris to Glasgow. And when I got on the flight, you know, you go left for first class. So I went left. Caviar, champagne, no, can't touch anything. I just sat down, waited for the lights to go out and just broke down saying, what kind of a planet am I in? Mm. See, I'd become a follower of Jesus. Mm. And uh, one of the things I'd learned was care for the poor. So, of course, yeah. I did my thing church i did my tithe i did my prayers and you know all the stuff i was an elder at the local church in london mm. and you know, all that stuff i said no, this is not right something doesn't square here so um i talked to my wife i said you know i can't sit one more day on my desk in the office i've got to do something about what i've seen i don't know what and then a friend introduced me to steve chalk and uh, he told me that he'd been there a few months, a few weeks before me, in fact, I think three months before me, maybe. And he'd come back also devastated with the sights he'd seen in exact same spot. Mm. And he wanted to do something. So we were introduced to each other. He walks into my boardroom. The story is in the book. And uh, basically, once we met, he shared with me how he'd started one little eat less, pay more restaurant, which they called Beggar's Banquet in Kent. And uh, when he shared the idea, I thought, you know, we discussed further and he said, I want to do more of these across the country because there are youth groups all over the country. I said, you know what? Why don't we aim to do 200 of these? If mm. one of them raised 5,000 pounds, my math says 5,000 pounds from 200 gives us a million pounds. Why don't we do that? Look for a million pounds, 200. I said, can you deliver the 200 youth groups? He said, well, I'll put the message out through these Christian magazines and other networks, youth networks. Let's see what happens. Well, 100 signed up. These I said, I don't like the word beggar's banquet because we ain't beggars where we come from. We, sure, we, you know, sure. Dignity yeah. is important. Yeah. So we called it Christmas Cracker. Pull the cracker, get a gift. And before we knew it, Christmas Cracker was born. And over seven years, through a range of initiatives, and again, these are my business skills coming into play. Because mm. when I we, we, we talked to my wife after my trip to the slum, people were saying, but you know, you're a businessman. You made so much for your business. You know, I had just done one shipment, Matt, where that one shipment, 7,000 tons of chicken worth $7 million, suddenly became $21 million after arriving at that port in Nigeria because they suddenly banned chicken overnight, which means your commodity is scarce, which means prices go up. So wow. that one shipment made $14 million clean net profit. <laughs> <laughs> they wow. said in 1990, this is 1987, right? That's so a lot of money. From now, what that is. Mm. So they said, look, you're doing all that. I said, no, we need to use the similar skills for the people who do not have. What can we do to really mobilize support that will help them? Not just aid, but trade and aid. Yeah. Teach them, you know, give them training. And, you know, that sort of thing began to be very real for me. So... We, we ran the project, it raised, uh, 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 well, I think it was nearly five million pounds wow. in seven years, but through That's restaurants and, and, and you know innovative ideas, radio stations one year, newspapers another year, the, the cracker, you know, mm. the cracker Liverpool or the cracker Humberside or whatever. These And it was real youth groups. And what excited me most was 50,000 teenagers getting mobilized to make a difference, but being challenged that when they then grow up from teenage to adulthood, they're already adults at teenage and teenagers, but mm. to really get out of the world, they would never forget that there are there are other communities who need help and that they would do what they can do to help those communities. So I was really pleased when I went to the House of Commons once, uh, this member of parliament approaches me, tall guy, and he picked up that I was the one of the co-founders, one of the chair, the, I was the founder chairman of Christmas Cracker. He came up to me, uh, thanked me and said, you know, I'm here today because I ran a cracker and I want to do make a difference. That's why I've become wow. an MP. Wow. And then I met people who were in the media, radio stations, journalists, 
many who said we're doing what we did because we cut our teeth during that time as we were growing up. So that really thrilled me to, to, to see that impact. So that was Christmas Cracker. And so when it came to running for mayor of London, coming back to your question, <laughs> why did I do that? <laughs> it is a long way to say to you, but so that you really appreciate and understand what drives sure. me, what drove me. It was uh, um, uh, seeing, uh, uh, by now, of course, I'd given up my executive role, but mm. I never gave up my business connections. So I took on a lot of non-executive chairmanships or directorships. Mm -hmm. So still using my skills now to help uh, uh, businesses grow, to help businesses succeed, but not spending my entire life and time just making money for myself. Yeah. And always helping helping businesses that I know are going to have a positive impact on the disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, 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 the chief executives or the boards or the drivers were really a socially responsible, uh, mm. uh, acceptable kind of business people. And so uh, one of the things I saw, and, and I joined public boards. So mm. that's another door that opened for me. Interestingly, by the way, through Christmas Cracker, because when I had done the first Christmas Cracker and visited India, my uh, uh, daughter shared, and she was only about six or something, shared the story with a teacher and friends. And so a teacher called me and said, well, would you come and speak to the kids at school about what you saw? Because it was this five-year-old kid and mm -hmm. the little girl. So they said, you know, they'll empathize with that. Come and speak to them. And so, um, uh, so I, I accepted to speak to them. And, you know, when I spoke to these young kids, like I would say they were five or six, maybe seven, eight, whatever their age was. One of the little girls went home and told her mom, this Indian man came today to school and he spoke about this thing and it was so nice to hear what they'd done. And yeah, you know, it was really good, very interesting. And I got lovely letters, which are still preserved from those kids. Wow. And so guess what? This mom was the uh, Sutton Council race equality officer. So I get a call Sunday lunchtime with my family from this lady. How oh, she got my number, who knows? And she said, Mr. Ginnamal, you spoke at school. My daughter was very taken. And all. Look, I'm the race equality officer. We are looking for a non-executive director for the Training Enterprise Council for South London. Wow. Would you be interested? I said, oh, I don't know what it does. It introduced me to the chief exec. So I went to see the chief exec. And uh, so he chatted. And he said, yeah, you're just the right profile. Seat on the board. Boom. Once I got that non-exec role, your name gets known. So I'm non-exec on several boards. Yeah. And, 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 and here on this particular board, they had a presentation from an economist. And he was showing us a map because the Training Enterprise Council is about training and training people to get into employment. Mm -hmm. And clearly, there are many disadvantaged communities right across Britain. And certainly, South London was no exception. Yeah. So he said... Um, uh, 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 you know, this economist comes and he looks at this whole, th he shows a map of London in 1890, a poverty map, and a map of London in 1990, a poverty map. And the poorer areas are shaded in yellow. Mm. So I looked at it, I said, hey, you could interpose the map one on top of the other, and there's no difference or very little. Oh, wow. What's happened in 100 years? Why can't we shift this poverty map? Mm. So that really blew my mind. And then having arrived as a refugee in the 1960s, uh, when the mayor of London issue was in the public square, young people, and that's why I made the point about Christmas Cracker and young mm. people, and these young people came up to me and said, um, uh, I'd done a BBC interview, and one guy came, as I was leaving the White City uh, Shepherds Bush Studios, tapped me on the shoulder. Mr. Gidumal, you know, we're looking for candidates to run for mayor of London. We've set up a brand new party. It's a Christian Democrat party, and, you know, gave me all that. I said, great, great, I'll give you names, mate. Give me your number. So... I call him back a week later and give him six names and said, these six people, excellent, go for them. He calls me back a week, two weeks later, he says, oh, Mr. Girumal, um, we've discussed it in our committee. Now, this all sounds very grandiose, right? Thinking, wow, your committee, <laughs> yes, this is Christian Democrat, what is this? You know, political party, whoa. He said, we'd love you to be the candidate. I said, mm, I'm going to chat with my wife, let me do that. Mind thinking. Wife says no. I can tell the wife says no. <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, from the moment he made that invite to me, uh, uh, things, my eyes opened in London. I could suddenly see mm. that the deprivation. I said, look, you came as a refugee. You may have now made it by having the successful business and everything else, but don't ever forget your roots. Mm. Don't ever forget 15 of you in, in, in four bedrooms with one bathroom and toilet and a basement that was an absolute disaster of a 
the skunk you call the word i mean stank and it was just mm. terrible you know but even you know when you survive you'll do anything yeah, right yeah. And 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 uh, I thought back to those days. I said, you know what? Maybe uh, these these boys and girls have a view a point. So I told them, I'll think about it, pray about it, and then I wanted to test the idea. So being a businessman, I sent out. Uh, I think it was like uh, I put out a thousand leaflets with a response slip to exp to check the interest in the community. Sure. And you know, I got a ten percent response. Oh wow! And I said, what? And now it was to a hot list, okay, I admit. Mm. But then I put when I put another mailing out to a cold list, it was still not a bad, like a three, four percent response. Mm. Now, you know, mm. cold mailings, you get a 0.7 percent response. If you're yeah. a business person, you know, even 0.1, 0.2. Mm. And you know all about mailing lists and mailing, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And here I am getting a three to four percent response. I said, there is something here. I think I should throw my hat in the ring and let's see what happens. So I agreed to do it with my wife. We both prayed agreed let's let's give this a shot and then of course i met those young people thinking there's a big huge group of them <laughs> 70 or 80 of them membership of this new political party <laughs> the committee that met was a group of six who decided yeah ram's a good candidate to run wow. <laughs> anyway i accepted i agreed i ran uh, the times newspaper broke the embargo headline former refugee throws out of the ring great i didn't mind at all the very first hustings turns up and I'm not a political guy. I have never run for politics. I've never belonged to this kind of stuff. And I'm called into this hustings. Mm. 15 of us. you got uh, people like Frank Dobson, former health minister, cabinet minister. Mm -hmm. You've got people like Glenda Jackson. You've got people like uh, 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 Stephen Norris, the conservative former London minister, for example. I mean, all these big shots there. Jeffrey Archer, by the way, was supposed to be there, but there was an empty chair. He was arrested that morning, so he couldn't oh. be there. <laughs> yeah, okay. but during the time, I mean, maybe not that yeah. morning, but yeah, around yeah. the time, yeah, yeah. there was a big scandal about his, his situation. So there I was, number 15, the last person, the newest kid on the block. They were all asked, what are you going to do for London? So every one of them answers, you know, first one says, oh, transport and housing and crime. And there was a lot of stuff, you know, and, every, and the three and you're three minutes, 15 mm. people, three minutes, and you only got an hour and a half at this particular hustings. So they wanted it tight and then a Q&A with the media. Yeah. So he answered and you know, on a Richter scale of zero to 10, he got an applause of seven. The second other candidate got maybe eight and the other one got six, but they were all doing well in the clapometer, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, there was a clap. They were all clapping, clapping, you know, they're like, they're saying, Oh, what did I get more? Did he get more? Ooh, did he get less? You know, all that kind of stuff. And then I'm sitting thinking, Oh, Lord, help me. Why am I here? I don't know how to speak like these guys. I mean, these guys are posh guys, you know, they, they've been to public school, they've done government ministries, they've been ministers of state. And here I am. <laughs> what can I say to these guys? And I thought about it. And I said, You know, I the thought that goes through my mind, What would Jesus do? Go on, think hard. Look, why are you running around? You're running because you've thought about this. You've seen that map mm. of London. You've seen the poverty map. You've seen the homelessness. You've seen all that. And you've experienced it yourself. Just go for it. Tell them about it. So it came to my turn. And I just went for it. <laughs> and effectively, Brilliant. the following day's newspaper had the headline, uh, Mr. Gidumal's uh, campaign for the carless, homeless, and jobless make him more radical than labor. And the, and the, and the, and the audience there just exploded when I gave my three minute spiel. Fantastic. I mean, it went way beyond the 10 on the Richter scale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we all start looking around, who is this upstart who suddenly turned up here and taken the glory of clapping? That night, now that all sounds very good for one's ego, Matt. But, <laughs> but, but, but I tell you, I tell you by at night, uh, uh, 10 o'clock, put the BBC radio news on, I'm going to bed, say to Sunita, I've got to hear the headlines, what's happening? The lead candidate is being interviewed. And so he's being asked, and so what is your policy and plan for London? And guess what he said in his response? Well, the carless, the homeless, the jobless. Oh. Are very cool. And I loved it. I just absolutely cracked up. I said to mm. Sunita, my wife, I said, this is fun. In <laughs> one meeting, I have shifted the agenda of the campaign. Fantastic. Everyone is now looking at the carless, mm. homeless, jobless, the poor, the disadvantaged, mm. the rich. They're all trying to put out policies for these people. And the mm. next day's newspapers, were the, the, the stories are all around that. I thought, you know, this is going to be fun. I may not end up as mayor of London. May not. Still got hope. But 
I've shifted the political agenda. Mm -hmm. This alone has made it worthwhile entering the race. Whether I win or not is not the issue. I'm now going to campaign to get them all to start shifting their agenda. And I tell you, one of the things I did, I saw, I saw a project in Sheffield. Mm. Uh, this was uh, an unemployment bond that was set up by my good friend, Michael Schluter, the Jubilee Center in Cambridge, the unemployment mm -hmm. bond was set up. And I saw that David Blunkett had bought a bond and that they they'd managed to raise a, a, a few hundred thousand pounds to, to, to help the unemployed get jobs. It's a very mm. special scheme mm. where, you, where, you, where you issue bonds at 0%, so you don't pay any interest on this. Mm. In those days, it was quite a big thing because interest rates were 40, 50%. Yeah. But there were people who had money lying in the bank and who were prepared to give that money at 0% if jobs were created, if the homeless were helped. And because it's a bond, they'll get their money back in five years. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. So they said, look, it's lying in the bank. You, know, you take it, use it create the jobs, create the housing, make the change in our community. And it's local bonds, mm -hmm. bond in every sense of the term, bonding and bond. And uh, I love the idea. I said, you know what, I'm going to do this following. I'm going to, uh, uh, gener I'm going to, I'm going to initiate a 500 million pound bond to regenerate and help with the needs of East London, which I've seen with my own eyes. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's in my manifesto. Wow. And of course, when they questioned me, they said, oh, Rand, Newcastle, New, <laughs> Newcastle was like, 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 like a half a million, million, two million. Uh, 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 Sheffield was half a million. <laughs> You're going to do half a billion pounds for London in this year. I said, well, think big, think yeah. hard. You know, when, yeah. the, when, when the Christmas, when the Christmas cracker, cracker Camp initiative started, the first interview I had with the BBC, they said to me, so, Mr. Gidumar, you're going to say, raise a million pounds with those 200 uh, restaurants with 5,000 pounds each. I said, look, if I aim for zero and raise 100 percent, what good is that? I'd yeah. rather aim and get some percentage of it and make a mm. difference to those communities. So here I said, we go for it. Now, it was a struggle. OK, the idea was in my manifesto. Mr. Michael Schluter came up to me after after the mayoral campaign uh, and he said, uh, Ram, you use this idea from that, that I had put in Sheffield, with my permission you used it, mm. and in Newcastle. Um, I know you're not mayor of London, but you believed in it to put it in your manifesto. Mm. I said, well, look, I'm a man of integrity. If I put it there, it's because I really believe it can be done. Yeah. And that was in the year 2000. I said, I, I know it can be done, and I'm going to make sure I do it. So let me, let, 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 let me think about it. And then he said, would you chair the initiative? Because I'm not a businessman. And it, it, it needs to be done in London, as you rightly say. So I said, I'll chair it. OK, it was a struggle, Matt. Matt, Matt. It really was a mm. battle to get the thing going. But today, we have issued over a billion pounds in social impact finance, wow. including including bonds quoted wow. on the London Stock Exchange. So the idea in 2000 was not off, 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 offline or, or, or off, off mm. the scale. Mm. It, again, it can be done. <laughs> Come back That's to my fantastic. thoughts. Yeah, yeah. You know, they say, oh, it can't be done. Hey, if we can't do a billion straight away, we can do half a million. We can mm. do two million. We can now build to five. We build to ten, and suddenly it's taken off. I, I, I mean, I did the account recently. I mean, I stepped down as chairman uh, earlier this year in April uh, uh, because my my goal was, can we hit the billion, and then mm. I can you know exit with dignity saying yeah we did it it wasn't just a, a, a poppycock and rubbish that was going on in, in 2000 i meant it uh, I, I wanted it and we as a team the whole team have done it and to me again it can be done and mm. now the sky's the limit they're going for you you know the, the, these guys who were taking it on are just going to go for it i know oh, wow. the different things yeah, yeah. Both, at all, you know so, it's a real difference on the ground because those, you know, MenCap issued a bond quoted on the London Stock Exchange, mm. the, the Golden Lane Housing Trust. Boom. And, you know, they've now gone for a second bond and others are doing it. And mm. suddenly the message is getting out. It can be done. That's fantastic. <laughs> Ram, there's, there's so many stories, right? <laughs> and that's what I, every time we chat, there's just more stories and I love it. Um, so you obviously there's a lot of challenges that you face and it can be done. Not, and, and I love that motto, that that whole concept, that whole idea. Um, 
What do you do? We, we talk about being on the show. Like, what do you do to be, to sort of fill your tank, to recharge your batteries, downtime, Sabbath? You know, what, how do you, how do you stay sane and, and <laughs> strong and healthy and still in love with your wife in the midst of all of this craziness? Well, I suppose one of the most important things is the power of prayer. My wife and I, every morning, I mean, every morning since she became a believer and I've been following Jesus, we pray every morning. Mm -hmm. This morning we prayed. We look at the day ahead and we said, let's pray for the day ahead. Pray for the children, the grandchildren, friends, those who are ill, those who have needs. Just we spend time in mm -hmm. prayer. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I read my Bible. You know, for me, I have a motto, another motto, no Bible, no breakfast. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that's been consistent with me for, for decades. So that, that's one, the whole spiritual side mm. of my life. That is a very important part of my being. Yeah. And then comes looking after your body. So uh, since lockdown and before, uh, walking every day, uh, you mm. know, when, you, when I walk, sometimes I walk with headphones, but sometimes deliberately leave the headphones just to reflect. Just to yeah. look at nature around me, think, use that time. And I do about, uh, I'll walk for an hour in the morning and then later in the afternoon, maybe another half an hour, an hour. Oh, okay. And yeah, so I do about six miles a day if I can, just to keep uh, keep fit. I don't mm -hmm. do gym and all that because I don't have the muscles and the <laughs> joints. So I can take it. <laughs> and then swimming, I try and swim at least four or five times a week, just 20 wow. minutes. I'm very religious about that, 20 minutes. I don't go for mm -hmm. the one hour, half hour. I'm not into that. Just if I get my 20 minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm a happy man. Mm. And so it's that. And then uh, uh, reading the newspapers. Uh, my paper is the Guardian, so you know where where I come from. That's the <laughs> daily read. Um, I thought it was the Times because in the book you talk about saving up every day for the Times. So obviously you've that switched to Mombasa. Yeah, yeah. That, that was in Mombasa. No, you're right. In Mom absolutely right. In Mombasa, I didn't even know that a paper called the Guardian existed. And an uncle uh, encouraged me to read the Times, but he lived in Nairobi and was very wealthy. Mm. Um, my, 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 my family couldn't understand why I would waste money on a newspaper. This was thin onion skin, mm -hmm. uh, you know, onion skin newspaper in those days because of the air freight. Yeah, and yeah. so I would go down and the, the, the newspaper shop was down. I would go and pick it up because he gave me that advice and read the Times. But at home, we would get another paper called the Mombasa Times. That mm. was the local rag, like your Guardian, local Guardian, or mm. the local freebie. And uh, this cost money, very small, you know, 5p or something. And so that would come home as well with, with the current news daily, the local Mombasa news. But the Times of Britain, I would also read, uh, not every day, by the way, because it was not cheap. But I would save pocket money to get it at least once a week, maybe twice a week, uh, and, and make sure that I read it so I could mm. understand what was going on. And uh, that, yeah, but in England, when I came, I discovered as a student that I was more, I suppose, to the left or center than to the right or center. I right. basically tended to be uh, what I called during my mayoral campaign, the dynamic middle. <laughs> 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 I like that phrase. I'm going to use that, the dynamic middle. I like that. Uh, yeah, I like to be the dynamic middle. So on mm -hmm. some, it's a bit to the right, some a bit to the left, but more, more often than not, it's to the left, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. And even the party I ran for, uh, was the Christian People's Alliance. It was a Christian Democrat party, but Christian Democrats tend to be labeled like with the Germans right wing. But yeah. we aligned ourselves with the Scandinavians, right? the Scandinavian Christian Democrats who are more to the left of center. But again, I said dynamic middle. I'm a businessman. So, yeah. you know, I want aid and trade. I want policies that can help businesses who will hopefully give for good, mm. who will give for good causes and, and, and help communities wherever they are. So it's all that combined, not very easy, but possible and can be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's no question of, oh, it can't be done. It can yeah. be done. Yeah, I have no doubt, Ram, and I've no doubt that you'll do it. So uh, you obviously your spiritual life's important, your family's important to you, you do physical exercise, you you seem to thrive when there's people around. Um, is love there it. any? I love it. Love yeah, it. I yeah. Love yeah. I, love, I, love, I love challenges. And you know, the, the, one of the things I learned doing my business they had a training course on creative thinking in action. Okay. It was the best training I ever got. How can you be creative? And there is a whole creative process I was taught about. I really never thought I was creative, if I'm honest with you. I yeah. thought I'm, you know, boring old whatever thing. I'll, that's what, you know, executive type and I'll do that. But that creativity uh, course in, in a book called 
the creative manager by mm-hmm. Roger Evans uh, really helped me a lot. And today that's an in, 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 in intrinsic part of my thinking, mm-hmm. you know, the data collection, the time of reflection uh, uh, when you've done your data gathering. And as you reflect, you suddenly find you get the aha moment. Ooh, I get to see mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. I haven't seen before. And then you say, okay, how do I implement it? Not quite. So let's get more data. And you go around in that circle thinking, hmm. And then you get to a point, aha. And that aha moment is your Archimedes, you know, you're right, I got it. I think I have, I know what to do. And so you implement. And it's that kind of process, which is very much part of me and and and, and how I look at stuff. Mm. So, you know, challenging mindsets, challenging assumptions. And so I can't do it. Why not? What are the assumptions here? Mm. How strong are the assumptions? Which are the assumptions that can really be challenged, which are immovable? If they're immovable, what can we do to move them? Mm. You know, and it's, it's it's that kind of thinking all the time. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. So, you know, the COVID crisis hits India. I get a call from a hospital in in, in which we're looking after in, in in the poorest part of India. And when they when they when they talked to when they when they spoke to me, they said we're in trouble. We've been declared a COVID hospital. What can we do? We need money to buy a generator. You know what? My wife and I sitting there said, let's put out an appeal. To our amazement, within a few weeks, they wanted twenty thousand pounds. Two hundred and thirty thousand pounds were raised. Wow! Not one, but three generators for that hospital, and the rest going to neighbouring hospitals. And wow. you feel can be done. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I, I'm aware of time, right? So if I can, let me uh, close with reading a quote from the back of your book. All oh, right. Uh, if I had to write a letter to my younger self, and perhaps in a way, that's what this is. I would tell him. These are the things that will save you. You must never give up. You must never let obstacles grow so high they seem insurmountable. Instead, always think about what you can do rather than what you can't. I would tell him about the importance of creative thinking, diplomacy and determination. Those things alone, however, suggest that we can do it all without help. I would be lying if I said that this was so. Help came from the love and support of family. It came from principles rooted in my Indian heritage. It came from learning from my elders. It came through relational networking, which is genuine friendship and compassion for others. And yes, because I follow Christ, I also believe that many of my breakthroughs came through the study of the Bible and through discussing things with God. And then you go on to say, but there is another, perhaps more surprising layer to this. I learned the real secret that I didn't need all the riches and all the recognition in the first place. And letting go of this false need for wealth has allowed me to live freely and generously, always having more than enough for a good life without any sense of envy towards those who have more. I just, when I read that, I thought, goodness me, what a, what a way uh, to end your book and what a lesson. Uh, I think, uh, and thank you for not just writing it for your family and uh, well done to your publisher for sharing it with the wider world because I think, Ram, I've known you for many years. We worked together on Tradecraft and we served on the board at Tradecraft PLC, which is a fair trade organization. Um, I looked forward to every single meeting that you were there because I took, I just took notes, like how is he figuring this out? And so thank you for being a teacher to me uh, over all of these years and being a friend. Um, there have been a few times when I've just called you and gone, Ram, I'm stuck, <laughs> help. Um, so thank you. And thank you for coming on the podcast, Ram. Honestly, I feel like I could go for hours and hours and hours and maybe we should get you back again to talk about some more stuff. But um, if people want to reach out to you, if they want to connect, what's the best way to do that? The e- email is the easiest way. Uh, and it's uh, ramgidumal at gmail.com. That's R-A-M-G-I-D-O-O-M-A-L at gmail.com. I am traveling a lot. <laughs> and uh, it, that may that may mean a long wait, but if you're prepared to wait a time, then by all means send me an email. And uh, yeah, and and where I can't help, I'll make it very clear uh, who to turn to, where to turn to. More mm. than happy to do that. But uh, yeah, be patient with me too. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and, I, yeah. and I would say to, to you, Matt, you helped me when you stepped into the board of Tradecraft. I was looking for someone exactly like you. There weren't many at all. In fact, nobody else. So when you came in, the skills you brought in and the gifts you gave us are also immeasurable and something that cannot be just bought like that. You did a huge favor to us. So thank you for all your oh, bless you. No, no, it was great.
It was great. Anyway. Loved it. Loved every minute. Uh, so, My Silk Road, The Adventures and Struggles of a British Asian Refugee uh, is available to buy. It might not be out straight away because your publisher had to send me a copy of this. Yeah, if you write to the publisher, if you go on the website and put My Silk Road Ram, you'll suddenly get the publisher. Mm -hmm. It's now, I believe, available in all good bookshops. So Fantastic. very soon on Amazon, but not yet on Amazon and being formally launched uh, 25th of November. In, okay. in, in 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 a food near near a food bank. Fantastic. <laughs> of course, it would be. Why any? Why would you do it any other way? Um, so, my Silk Road: The Adventures and Struggles of a British Asian Refugee. Honestly, go out buy the book. You'll really enjoy it, and buy it as a gift for people. Uh, it's a fantastic read. You will not be able to put it down. I was saying to Ram before we hit the record button, I've not actually finished reading the book yet uh, because I've had to try and wrestle it off my wife, uh, who has just been absorbed by the whole thing. Uh, we will, of course, link to Ram's info in the show notes. We will link to the book and the publisher in the show notes. Uh, so uh, we will get those out, no problem. Uh, and you can get that for free on the website, pushtobemore.com or direct to your inbox if you sign up to the newsletter ram thank you so much for joining me honestly it's been amazing thank you matt i've loved it too and appreciate all that uh, you've done thank you oh brilliant so there you have it what a great conversation a huge thanks to ram for joining me today wasn't he fantastic i'm gonna have to you're gonna have to listen to this more than more than once i've no doubt uh big shout out again to today's sponsor orion media if you are wondering if podcasting is a good marketing strategy for your business do connect with them at orionmedia.com that's a u r i o n media.com uh, we will of course link to them uh, on the podcast website push to be more.com uh, and also in the show notes. Uh, so you can find Orion anyway like that. Now be sure to follow Push To Be More podcast wherever you get your podcast from because we've got some more great conversations uh, lined up and I don't want you to miss any of them. And in case no one, dear listener, has told you yet today, you are awesome. Yes, you are. Uh, it's just a burden that we all have to bear. Uh, Ram's awesome. I'm awesome. You're awesome. It's just it is, it is what it is. So Push To Be More is produced by Orion Media. You can find the entire archive of episodes on your favorite podcast app. The team that makes this show possible is Sadaf Bain on Josh Catchpole, Estella Robin and Tim Johnson. Our theme music was written by Josh Edmondson. And as I mentioned, if you would like to read the transcript or show notes, head to the website pushtobemore.com, where you can also sign up for the weekly newsletter and get all of this good stuff direct to your inbox totally free. That's it from me and that's it from Ram. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic week. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.